people from the hallway to come down and be part of our opening ceremony. Information and 
documentation and things that will help uh, you and your household, your workplace, uh, be prepared for emergencies. But again, it's my pleasure. My name is Jody Gonzalez. I'm the Denton County Director of Emergency Services, which is Fire Marshal and Emergency Management uh, for the county. Uh, it's my pleasure today to be able to introduce uh, several of the few people that make this, this day happen, uh, as, well, as well as the sponsors from the uh, city of Little, or town of Little Elm. And we're proud to have with us today. Mayor David Hillock, mayor of the town of Little Elm, uh, to welcome you. Mayor. Good morning. Good morning. This is the coolest thing about living in Little Elm, being the mayor of Little Elm, Texas. This is the official uniform of Little Elm, Texas. So uh, we're going we're gonna to have a light rodeo after this event. We've got a whole bunch of stuff going on today, so the short seemed like a good idea. Uh, I want to thank you for coming today. Um, this, it's always great to be prepared, especially this time of year. Uh, we're kind of rolling into the really fun times. My hope is that this summer we'll just be as full of sunshine and butterflies, and that's it. And we'll have beautiful days on the beach. But I do uh, really appreciate Congressman um putting this event together just to be prepared, to make sure that we're ready for whatever comes in case it comes. Um, and hopefully all we'll have to worry about is how much sand will carry it back into the house. But if something bigger comes, we'll be ready for it. So thank you for coming out today. Uh, I look forward to getting a lot of great information and probably for me personally, more importantly, going and seeing the helicopter. That's my favorite thing. But um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you get a lot of information from it. And at this time, I will uh, introduce our host for today, Daniel Gallagher, the superintendent of the Welcome to the School. Thank you. Thank you for being here. First, I want to say, obviously, Mayor Hilla not call each other and coordinate. Um, this is the official outfit for the superintendent of the OMISD. So thank you, uh, Mayor Hillock. And I want to echo what Mayor Hillock said about um, the great things happening here in Little Elm. As you drove through, uh, I'm sure you can see the changes that have happened. We're proud of this community. I'm very proud of the school district. We're proud of this for Congressman Burgess. Uh, one of our one of the, the things that we tell our, our community is our mission is to engage and put and empower our students to reach their full potential. And one way we, we do is through incredible opportunities like what we see with our culinary students. So uh, we're proud of that. Um, thank you again for being here. And at this time, I want to introduce Dr. Michael Bridges, Congressman, Congressman Bridges. After spending nearly three decades practicing medicine in North Texas, Congressman Michael Burgess was first elected in, uh, to Congress in 2002 and was re-elected most recently in November 2016. Dr. Burgess currently represents the majority of Denton County and parts of Tarrant County. As of the 115th Congress, Dr. Burgess is the most senior medical doctor on both sides of the aisle, serving in the U.S. House of Representatives. He serves on the prestigious House Energy and Commerce Committee, where he is the chairman of the Subcommittee on Health. He also serves as a mem member of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations and the Subcommittee on Digital Commerce and Consumer Protection. In addition, he is a member of the House Rules Committee and the Hels Helsinki Commission. So please join me in welcoming Congressman Michael Burgess. Thank you, Daniel, and Ben. Thanks to the town of Little Elm, Mr. Mayor. You know, thank you for, for letting us be here on your wonderful campus this morning. I, I am told this is the tenth time we're going to do this. Uh, I got to tell you, April in Texas, it's tricky. <laughs> Some days it'll be just like this. And it's just so absolutely beautiful to say, why in the world are you having a, a, an event that focuses on severe weather? lovelier than a Texas day, right? But having grown up in the area, I know things can change, and it can change very quickly. And uh, some, of the, uh, some of my earliest memories growing up in this area were Services. Of course, you've heard from Jody Gonzalez, who's our moderator this morning. He's the county 
emergency preparedness director, heard from the mayor. At all levels of government, people are involved in disaster preparedness and emergency response, but really, the first response has to be us. And our preparedness can set the stage as to whether or not everything else works out at a time of crisis. So that's why uh, every year I try to pull one of these together. We do it in various places around the district, so it's not always in the in the same location. Um, I think it's important for you to meet the people that are involved in the in the planning and the preparedness. People who would be involved if there were a, if there were actually a, an urgent situation that required response, but. I always want to bring it back to it's us. It's on us. It's our responsibility uh, to ourselves and to our families. Have that ability to know what to do, know where to go, know how to communicate with your with your other family members, know how to contact each other. Um, we are going to hear from a number of experts this morning. We really are very very fortunate. Uh, we've already heard from Joe Gonzalez, who's one who has kindly agreed to moderate this event. Uh, we're going to hear from. We've got some weather experts coming in. Mark Fox, who's from the National Weather Service, who's uh, in charge of uh, warning and coordination. Rick Mitchell from NBC5 is going to talk to us about making sense of Texas weather. I'm glad he has that task and not me, because I don't know that I ever have been able to. You know, when I grew up, it was, uh, it was Harold Taft. Uh, if you remember Harold, but he was always the one that we watched during times of crisis and severe weather. Um, we had a big, a big problem in Labor Day weekend with a hurricane that came ashore and went back up and came ashore and went back up and dropped a, an unprecedented amount of rain. First there were the winds in Corpus Christi and Freeport and then the <coughs> unprecedented amounts of rain in Houston went back up to the Gulf and then came back in the uh, Beaumont, Port Arthur area, received unprecedented amounts of rain and the <coughs> amount of response that was required during that storm, and we are going to hear from, from people who were involved in that. Just a couple of weeks ago, I went down to a field hearing down in Cypress, Texas. Uh, Brian Robinson, who's our, our FEMA Region 6 director, was part of the uh, one of the witnesses who testified down there. It is a, obviously, it was a, a significant task for just getting through the event, but now the recovery, and it has been a, 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 a difficult uphill struggle for many people in that area. FEMA has continued to uh, continue to stay involved in that. Um, I'm really, really pleased that we're going to hear from Dr. Kevin Yeske today. Dr. Yeske is from the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, he's in the uh, office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, affectionately known as ASPR, uh, under its acronym. Uh, Dr. Yeske has uh, really been a leader in this area. And we're, we're really very, very fortunate to, uh, to hear from him today. Tony Robinson, as I mentioned, who's the FEMA Region 6 Director, uh, FEMA Region 6 Regional Administrator, will be joining us later this morning to talk about uh, FEMA's response to Hurricane Harvey and the ongoing recovery. And uh, uh, there, clearly there will be opportunities for, for Q&A after, uh, after each of the presentations. Um, we learned that drones were a critical part of the uh, of the response for Hurricane Harvey, and we're also going to hear from local leaders about the use of those unmanned aerial platforms and how they have become. You know, when I first did this probably 10 years ago, the drone technology was uh, was really something that was far removed from what we people would think of in their daily lives, and now it's become much more of an integral part of our lives. So we're going to hear about those unmanned aerial systems, those platforms, and how they can help us in disaster preparedness and disaster response. Uh, there could be hazards beyond the weather, and it is important that each of us is prepared for any danger that could come from, from any direction. So we are going to start our morning discussion with school safety as we seek to ensure that North Texas students are safe. Uh, also, during his remarks, Dr. Yeske will discuss the Department of Health and Human Services and their response to the Las Vegas shooting last fall. As always, I, I do want to take a moment to recognize our first responders here in North Texas who commit every day selflessly, and certainly we know uh, 
mindful of the fact that you're in Little Elm. We, we lost one of our own a little over a year ago. So can we just take a minute and thank the first responders who are here? And that's true, they are the first responders, and they're here to help us, you, the citizen. But I, again, I can't emphasize this enough. Really, the first response starts with us. It starts with, with, with us as individuals, with us as families, and our preparedness, our degree of preparedness can affect the outcome of, of any event. Um, again, thank you to all the participants and everyone who's gotten up early on a Saturday morning. I realize there's lots of things that can be for your time. It is, uh, it is a lovely day. Um, seems like most of the years that I do this, there's kind of like an impending bad weather event that kind of drives some momentum to, uh, to, to, uh, to be here and, and get the information. Today is deceptive. Again, it is, it is so unbelievably nice. Uh, Dr. Gesky, you're probably wondering why everybody in the country doesn't live in Texas. As you can see around here, they're actually moving here, and that's a good thing. It's, uh, it's an area of phenomenal growth. Um, I hope you will find the information uh, useful and, and uh, be able to incorporate it into, uh, into your plans and your, in your own uh, lives and your own families. Again, special thanks to Little Elm Independent School District and, and Little Elm High School for acting as our hosts this morning. Certainly our appreciation to Mayor Hill and the town of Little Elm and Denton County Emergency Services. It's my pleasure to represent you in the United States House of Representatives. Jody, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Congressman, again for all your support and, and your uh, just diehard uh, approval of what you know the emergency preparedness programs or emergency services in Denton County and Tarrant County do in your in your uh, district. I can tell you that uh, numerous times I've been on, out on situations with explosions or major grass fires or severe weather events. And, and the congressman will reach out to me and call me on my cell phone. I'll be out in the middle of it. He says, "Hey, I'm just looking out for the district," and, and that means a lot to me. You know that I, you know that my U.S. congressman. I can call him on a cell phone, and he calls me and asks me what's going on in, in his district, and, and it's, he can be in Washington. So when I'm in Washington, let me know. I, I hear something's going on, and that's important to me as a local responder that, that he cares that much. So uh, thank you again for what you do for the for the district and, and for emergency preparedness. <coughs> With that, we'll move forward to uh, a presentation by uh, Little MISD on school safety. Uh, there is a little bit of a change. The moderator today, instead of Billy Coburn, who's the Director of Safety and Security, uh, was not able to be with us here today, but Dr. Tony Tipton is going to step in over community, uh, uh, community resources for the school district. And uh, if you will, also, uh, uh, there is a packet in the back of your Form here that does have each one of the uh, listed speakers here today and their background information and a little brief on who they are and where they're from. So that is information in there as well uh, that you have for reference material on all of your speakers here today. One other note, a uh, housekeeping uh, note that this is event and this speak speakers today are all being live streamed to Dr. Uh, Michael Burgess's YouTube page so that if you didn't catch this today, or you need to step out and move to some of the uh, different uh, vendors throughout the day that you'll be able to catch up to that or get family members on a specific, specific topic that you heard today or somebody else that you wanted to be aware of some of the things that were brought up today, you can go back and find that uh, through the U.S. Dr. Burgess's YouTube page. So with that, I'll introduce and welcome Dr. Tony Pitt. Well, thank you so much for, for coming today, and we're, we're pleased to have you here. And I was very, um, it was very nice to hear uh, the congressman's words about uh, thanking our first responders because it means so much to us in Little Elm and, and what they do for us. And in fact, it's kind of timely. We actually, uh, I believe on Monday night, our school board just decided to name one of our brand new middle schools after our fallen friend, Detective Jerry Walker. And so we're super proud of that accomplishment. Let's give a round of applause to our school board for that wonderful first responder. So in Little Elm, 
we like to believe that leadership falls at all levels of the organization. And so because we had a change in the schedule today, I received a call from, from Mr. Coburn this morning saying that he was not feeling well and wasn't going to be able to be here. And so Mr. Coburn has nominated um, Mr. P from Little Elm High School is going to be our moderator for our safety briefing today. So I'm going to ask Mr. P to come on up. And, I, and while he's doing that, I'm going to introduce the, the members of our panel. We have Doug Severe, principal of Chavez Elementary School. Come on up. Marnie Richardson, assistant principal at Presswick STEM Academy. And Officer J.P. Alexander, our middle school SRO with the Colony Police Department. And then, of course, I just uh, introduced Mr. P, who's a house principal here at Little Elm High School. And then Officer Eric Olson, who is a high school SRO. So I'm going to get you guys to join us over here on the right. And we may have to drag up a couple of more um, high back chairs. Eric, you want to grab a couple of those? And school safety for us, that's our number one job. We want our, we want our parents to send their kids to school, and we want them to come home in the same shape or better than what they left them with us. So school safety is our number one priority. We take it very seriously in Little Elm. And as I think you'll see, we have a wonderful plan in place to help keep kids safe and also the adults who, uh, who serve in our buildings. So, Mr. P, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you uh, let you seat the guests and let, let you get it started. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, again, uh, thank you all for being here. Welcome to Long High School. I am extremely blessed and proud to be here in, uh, where I'm standing because uh, for the last three years I've served I've served as an assistant principal here at the high school and. Uh, when Mr. Colbert called me this morning and asked me to kind of step in and kind of moderate, for a split second I was just a little bit nervous and then I said to myself, I do this every day, there's nothing to be nervous about. So when we talk about school safety and working with um, all these uh, people here, this is something that we do best. Uh, we, we focus on two aspects as uh, principals, you know, safety and security is one, one of the top priorities and then the instruction is the second one. And without feeling safe, uh, the instruction can happen. So, Lil Arm ISD has a comprehensive safety and security program in place. Um, we take the safety of our students and staff very seriously. And as part of our program, we use the best practice to ensure we do everything possible to protect our students when they are in our care. So, from the moment we open the doors in the morning to the moment they load up on the buses and the parents pick them up, we are here uh, serving your kids and making sure that they're taken care of. Some of the examples that we, uh, what we do in Willow ISD is, I'm gonna start off with uh, the camera system. So we have added uh, cameras to every single one of our campuses from elementary to high school. High school does have the most cameras. Uh, they are mounted in the ceiling, some are on the walls, and they're monitored by our assistant principals uh, on a daily ma uh, map. And uh, at the high school level, we have four houses, we are split into uh, by alphabet, and each house office has a secretary and a counselor. Our secretaries and uh, principals and the counselors are on dual monitors. One of them always displays cameras appropriate to the closest hallways that we supervise. Our front office staff also has cameras access, as well as our um, other assistants that are within our campus. Um, those cameras do store footage. We work closely with uh, company. Um, CNR that monitors and helps us support with updates, trainings, or any kind of uh, uh, items that might pop up so we can retrieve the footage and be proactive rather than reactive. Um, along with that, we have something called a uh, visitor management system where there is a raptor system in the front office. So anytime any visitor comes to our campus, for whatever reason, uh, maybe a child, whether it's a flooded coach or a college recruiter, they do go through a front office system where they check in and scan, and that uh, Raptor system does pick up a variety of things. All of our campuses, I believe, uh, as of right now, are on the Raptor system. It does scan their driver's license and print out a name tag, so that where our staff in the hallways can spot if somebody is walking around, and we can greet them, welcome to our high school, and also find out where they need to be. Um, we also have access control key fobs. Um, every one of our campuses will have a key fob that looks like this. And uh, basically it's a quick access to the door. It will tra track and monitor entrance 
uh, of personnel and it's directly tied to the system that can be monitored on the back end so we can actually automatically lock and unlock doors for events such as in athletic events, fine art events, and events like this so we can go in and set a time when it unlocks and, and also locks it up. It helps us at the campus level here because of our passing periods and students being able to go from one end to the other one so we can also lock and unlock at certain times, especially in the mornings when we open up the building and late in the afternoons. One of the things that we take pride in is drills. Uh, our students uh, and, and staff uh, do enjoy those drills because we get to uh, practice and do what we do best. So we do a uh, fire drill once a month uh, and, and we try to create scenarios, uh, obstructed exits and throw some curveballs at them so we can practice for a variety of scenarios. We will do lockdown drills, we will do inclement weather drills. And at that point, uh, either myself or Mr. Reza, who's our associate principal, will get on the announcements, let the kids and staff know so we can follow protocol. Uh, we brief after those drills, we work closely with the LEPD as they uh, work closely with us and we obviously take it very seriously and we take the feedback and we'll tune it up and try it again next time with, with better results. Um, every campus um, also builds a crisis team and um, those, that crisis team also talks about um, items that are not necessarily on a daily basis going to happen, but we need to be prepared on that. You know, I can speak for the high school. We talk about events such as, you know, if something happens on a football field or a baseball field, you know, what do we do in a situation like that? If we have, uh, you know, something happen in the kitchen, what would we do in a situation like this? So we table topic, we have discussions, and we basically uh, find out the best case scenario. And again, having that partnership with LEPD and the fire department and just the, the, the town alum is, is crucial so that way we can plan for our uh, procedures and how they're going to be operational and best fit our staff and our community. Um, the next item that we talk about is the campus training, um, team training, and these are the courses suggested by Texas, Texas School Safety Center. So Mr. Copeland and I do attend the safety, uh, school safety center uh, conferences over the summer where we meet with other districts across the state, other law enforcement, um, agencies uh, as well as our officers that attend NASRO and we, we bring all those trainings back and we talk about how it's beneficial and what can we do with those items here at the high school here at the district because it's not all just about the high school you know the elementary from K to 5 is where it starts and then you know the secondary level begins so all those uh, trainings that we attend we basically take that and, and train our staff here that couldn't attend so that way we're all aligned and we practice anything from, uh, you know, the, the, the searches, the securing the locks, the doors, and the perimeter, and what that looks like. The, what are we looking for, you know, from the vehicles in the parking lot to the overall campus and, and the structure. Um, one of the things that Mr. Coburn was able to add is a feature called the lockdown button. So right now all of our campuses are currently having this. Uh, in, the, in the front office there is a button that the it's not a red button like the Staples button push it, but it is, it is a button that you would have to pull. And the moment that button is activated, all of our outside doors are automatically locked. The key fob would no longer work, only the key would work. And at that point, a series of things is triggered, such as the, you know, the appropriate messaging to our superintendent's office, the police office, obviously the SROs get a call, the campus principal gets a call, these notifications go out saying that we are in a lockdown so therefore you know the next level of uh, uh, intervention is going to happen uh, and like I said we're so blessed that the uh, local police officer are here on campus we have two SROs uh, here at our campus the, the police department is so nearby that we, we really have that sense of uh, safety here that we are well taken care of uh, one of the things that we added this year, and uh, every campus has received a set of uh, two-way radios. Our radios from the past were uh, analog, now they're digital, so our reception is a lot, uh, it, it's, it's more clear, and the range is a little bit further out, which is crucial as we have events at the stadium, as 
well as out here on the field. So um, I've only tested as far as uh, Chavez and our admin office sellers that it, it is clear to the high school. So that gives me a good uh, hope that our message can carry out that far. So our two-way radios are given to all the appropriate personnel from the secretarial staff to the front office staff to the SROs and even our custodial maintenance staff so we can stay in contact. Um, and they do carry a two-way message back and forth. Um, every campus has a vestibule built in. So that's basically the little entrance when you walk in that you can't just go straight into the building. You would have to go through the office check-in and then be kind of buzzed into the rest of the campus except for two. Uh, Chavez and Brent will be added this summer. So there's a plan in pro uh, process right now. But if you came through the front office area to be here today, you would have walked through ours. To the left would be the front office area where you check in where I talked about that rafter system. But that's the vegetable that was built in. Um, on the topic of SROs, like I said, we, we're blessed to work with these guys. We have two at the campus at all times. Um, the goal is to have an SRO on each one of our campuses, and I believe that uh, they're adding SROs each year. So the, the idea of having a, that report, working with kids, knowing your uh, students on a daily basis, and uh, having that mentality of guiding them to the, make those better decisions and being an additional adult that influences student lives it is huge on top of the safety aspect, who they are and what they, what they serve. So uh, again, we are blessed to be working with the SROs and uh, so thankful that they're here. Um, and the last item on the agenda that I have is the unarmed security uh, guards that we have on our campus. Right now we have four that are housed at the high school. Um, I know Mr. Colburn has talked about adding uh, more in the future. We are considering adding a security officer that would monitor district-wide cameras. From our system here at the high school, we have uh, something called the command center. It's basically uh, where we can watch all cameras from the district from K to 12 on uh, huge monitors. And we have uh, the weather and the news on TVs as well. So we can monitor what's going on uh, district-wide. So we talked about having a security officer that would be able to treat that footage in a timely manner. So when incidents do happen, or we see something potentially happen, that we're proactive. But right now we we have four security officers that help us monitor and uh, uh, monitor the perimeter outside, check the doors to the classrooms, walk the hallways, and basically just kind of give us an idea of what's going on, recognizing the students. Um, recognizing the adults in the building and just being there to greet and meet, but also help us uh, with that overall safety factor. Um, that's about as far as I have on the agenda. Again, um, I'm Mr. Alan Paul Slomich. I'm one of the assistant principals at the high school. And again, I enjoy working here with these guys. So we will open yeah. up for questions. Sure. So I think I think one of the pieces that we um, that we wanted to do was open it up for, for questions. If anybody in the audience has any questions about school safety, I know it's it's really on the minds of folks right now with things that are happening in our country and around our state. So if anybody here has any questions about school safety, you have the folks right here in front of you who can answer that right at this time. So if there's anything out there, we'd love to hear from you. Yes, sir, Mr. Gallagher. I don't have a question. Okay. and the relationship we have with the town, and specifically our police department. We have an incredible relationship with Chief Harrison and the town, and I wanna thank the mayor for, um, for his assistance with that. Our police officers um, routinely, and, and uh, Chief Harrison, they, they review our plan, and we work with them in developing the plan that we have. And you know, Chief Harrison has said many times, we've got one of the best plans he's ever seen in terms of uh, public school safety and taking care of our kids. So that's something we're very proud of. And again, just working with Chief Harrison in the town, um, we're blessed that we have that relationship and blessed that we've got the, um, just the, the partnership with them. So I want to thank them for that. And, um, and again, thank the panel for answering questions and being here today. So I actually do, uh, this is 
even though I know the plan pretty well, that there's some pieces of it that, that, that I need a little clarification on. I have, I have two students that go to Little Elm ISD. So I have a sixth grader who goes to LMS, and then I have a student at the high school. I would like to know what differences that there might be between a high school crisis response and maybe a middle school or an elementary response, because I know it, it, it can differ in some of the things that we do. So I'd like to, to get the microphone over and just get a, a high school perspective and then a middle school and an elementary perspective. Um, depending on the crisis we have, let's, uh, if we needed to go into a lockdown, like he said, um, we have very uh, good practice and procedures in place to where we would try to uh, shield the kids as best we can through a locked door. And really what we try to do is get two, uh, two barriers between any intruder and that person. Um, our kids practice that, we talk about that, we uh, answer any questions that parents might have, and those always come up whenever there's an incident and a nationwide news where uh, maybe a school has had uh, some tragic event. But um, every parent that I've ever talked to that has heard what we have in place um, has been satisfied with what we're gonna do. It's one of those things as a principal, I really wish I could tell a parent, this will never happen at this school, but I can. Um, society the way it is, um, we prepare for the worst, and uh, we pray every day that it doesn't happen, but I can guarantee you this, we have procedures in place that will keep our kids and our staff safe as we uh, enter into any type of uh, situation that might occur. All right, to piggyback off of what Doug just said, we have procedures in place as well. We are K-8, so we really look at the education piece. We need to make sure that we talk to our kiddos and let them know what's going to happen. happen. We prepare them. We also prepare our parents. Just because when your kindergartner or second grader comes home and they're gonna tell you that, hey, we did a lockdown drill, parents need to know what that is. So we really make sure we partner with our parents, explain our policies and procedures, talk to our students so that they know what to expect. As far as the high school is concerned, um, Again, I'm fortunate to work with uh, Mr. Colburn because his office is housed here. So him and I exchange a lot of ideas and I really do uh, take pride in what we do, we build together. Um, what, what would come up is a EOP binder and a folder. So we have two versions. One is a digital version that's shared to all of our staff members with all the procedures from inclement weather to tornado to lockdown to any case scenario. The other one is the actual hard copy. So we created a green, neon green binder that's on their desk at all times. So when a crisis does arise, we're not looking at our bookshelf where it is. If we have a substitute in the, in the classroom, it's easily marked and it's right there. And you, it's literally you flip the page and it tells you what to do. It's, it's tabbed, indexed, marked, and all of that. We provide full maps, um, all case scenarios, and everything. Um, uh, the next layer on that is every morning our attendance is sent out campus-wide so our teachers know which subs are in the building. So in case we do have a crisis or we just need to know where we need to be more present, we can walk those hallways and let those subs know, hey, we're here for you, this is where you can find this, and so on and so on. Our department chairs are very involved with that as well. Um, we are close with the police officers. Every morning we check in, we check in throughout the day, we're on the radio at all times. And uh, depending on a crisis, we call this situational leadership. Depending on the situation, we would appropriately respond. So depending on what it is, the certain levels, it will be triggered you know, from uh, Mr. Gallagher's office all the way down. And obviously the, the biggest one is the communication for the community because you know, we did a lockdown drill and you know, I can't tell that a student didn't text mom and dad and say, oh my gosh, we're in a lockdown when it's just a drill. So we want to be diligent that we sent a message that this is a drill, but we need to take it seriously because it is that important for the safety and overall. So the communication piece is there as well, um, where, it, where it comes from Ms. Pentecost with the blackboard or Mr. Reza, uh, campus-wide and community-wide. So all of these steps are kind of in our binder for the EOP procedures and our department meetings and our faculty meetings. We go over all these steps and as we meet regularly, because I meet with safety and security, my security staff every morning kind of talk about here's a day at a glance, here's a week at a glance. We just keep reminding ourselves uh, of, the, of the things to be looking out for. Because to me it's about preventing, uh, minimizing 
the risk as much as I can rather than saying it's never going to happen. And uh, hopefully you found some alignment listening from uh, K through K through 12 because the goal of our, Mr. Colburn was always to have a clear aligned path of what the procedure should be with minor adjustments because understanding secondary and elementary. Any questions? Has, has this spurred any questions with you? Yes, sir. I'm going to bring you the microphone. Thank you. I'm Timothy Curtis. I have a daughter at Little Elm High School. I'd like to add, ask each of the panel members, what is the worst actual crisis you've had to deal with? Not drill, but actual crisis. I'll take a second and just think because uh, in the last three years, um, I would have to say that I remember that we we possibly had a uh, maybe a smell odor that was coming and we weren't sure if we um, needed to evacuate the building or just a certain area and we were not sure during the construction if it's a sewer line that was hit or we didn't want to take chances so we went through that scenario okay let's get the students out of this area first into the next area but besides that and that was very if that's the highest i'll take it but uh the next one would be just inclement weather being outside on the baseball field for a event and just having everybody come out inside the hallways because we knew that coach howells who monitors the weather in, in the city has communicated you know we have a storm coming in lightning was spotted so we need to uh go ahead and head inside uh also so I started at the high school back in 2013, uh, then promoted up to detective, uh, and recently was asked to, to come back to help out as the, the second SRO here. So right after I started, within about three weeks of uh, me first getting assigned to the high school in 2013, uh, I had a coach that was walking by my office in the morning, saw him every morning, and uh, he walked by, I said good morning, and kind of stuck his head back and he goes, hey, I forgot to tell you, yesterday out at the football field, uh, there's a kid that said he was going to bring a gun to school and shoot up the school. So I just thought I'd let you know. He started walking back away from me. So I, I actually, I go and I grab the back of his shirt collar and I grab it in my office. I said, okay, we're going to have a conversation now. Tell me what's going on. So we find out who the kid is, what the nature of the threat is, and uh, I was brand new. I didn't know, I didn't know our lockdown procedures. Uh, I got put into the school in the middle of the semester. Uh, so uh, I was the other SRO at the middle school. I had just started at the beginning of the semester, so there wasn't a whole lot, lot that we knew at that point in time. Uh, but I, um, I made the decision that we were going to move into lockdown because I didn't know where my threat was. I didn't know what we were doing. Uh, so we, we went ahead and uh, moved into a lockdown situation, and uh, within seven minutes, uh, I had every police officer from Little Elm. Uh, here at my, around the campus somewhere. Uh, we had intersections closed off. Uh, we were in complete, I mean, our, our, the perimeter uh, was completely locked down. Uh, within 12 minutes, uh, we had uh, Briscoe PD, uh, Denton County Sheriff's Office, Oak Point PD had come over, uh, I believe Prosper had come down. Uh, and so we had, we had agencies from all over. Uh, there was a guy from Frisco that I just met uh, by happenstance the week prior, and he's calling me going, hey, my guys are staged over at the fire station. He was an SRO at Lone Star High School, uh, just down the road on the other side of 423. So we're staged, we're ready to go. You let us know what you need, and we're here. Um, it took us about, about 20 minutes uh, to figure out that we did not have a threat on campus. Uh, we were able to locate the student uh, with parent uh, down in Dallas. Um, he had made the threat, and that was ended up being dealt with. Um, but it was a great learning procedure for me to figure out what our policies and procedures were, uh, and, and we really were able to, to have a great debrief um, for that. Uh, Mr. P was not here at that time. He's, he's joined our staff since then. Um, that gave us a great, uh, just a great way to kind of really know what we were doing uh, and have an actual live event uh, that was not a drill. I mean, we were in, in lockdown. I believe um, for about 
about an hour uh, total. Even though we, we found it, the, figured out that the student was not with us, we, we still wanted to make sure we didn't have any other threats. We were already here, we were already in our protocol, and uh, we swept the building to make sure that everything was, was safe and secure and on about our day. Yeah, one, uh, one comment I wanted to make, uh, I appreciate you bringing up the, the threats. Um, we live in an age where every child, every student, for the most part, has one of these. And um, we, how do you monitor this? One of the things that we do in this district, we have several filters that we use, and one of them is called Gaggle. And it sends a, when there's a, anything, keywords, any type of threat, if you, it catches words like gun or shooting, anything like that, it sends a message directly to the administrators, directly I receive the message, our deputy superintendent receives the message, we all receive these messages, so what happens immediately is we contact the campus, get them on it, they'll contact the officers, and I can tell you, it's happened on the weekends. We'll get a message over the weekend, and the first thing I do, I pick up the phone, I call our deputy superintendent, he's on the phone with typically to be Chief Harrison, and we go through our protocols and we follow through um, and we had an incident, uh, not, not an incident, but a situation, a potential situation, not too long ago where it was on the weekend, went through the protocols, we were able to um, stop the student before school even started. So um, it was a false threat, it wasn't legitimate, but we take every single threat seriously and, um, and again, in the digital age that we're in, it's very, very tricky, but um, we're, we're always on top of that. And that's something I wanna, I wanna thank this group for because um, they don't ever stop working. Because when it comes to student safety, it's 24 seven. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Um, well, I think we're being flagged for time. Uh, we have other other events that are, that are behind us here. Uh, thank you for your question. I wish we could have gotten to all our panel members, but I know they'll be here. And by the way, we're always here for you and your questions. It's not just today. This is what we do. Student and staff safety is our priority. So anytime you have a question, Mr. Gallagher has an open door, as do I, and as do our safety and security. Uh, Billy Coburn, our principals, our APs, our officers. So if you ever have any questions, concerns, let us know, reach out to us, and let's give a hand to our panelists today. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. P, for stepping up and taking the lead on the on the fly this morning. So thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Right, thank you to uh, Little MISD and their administrative staff. I can tell you as a school board trustee to a neighboring district that this is some of the, the most important work that's being done in our children and in our, in our community is what the school district and their, and their administrators do. Real quickly before we get on to this, I do want to recognize a few uh, additional folks that are here today, uh, if you will. Mayor Sue Tama from Town of Copper Candy. Mayor, thank you for being here. Also, we have with us Mayor Mike Donnelly from Double Oak. Thank you, thank you. And then we have uh, Mr. Jim Carter, who is the president of the Denton County Emergency Service District Number One. That is the emergency service district that services Argyle, Copper Canyon, the North Lake area, and the southern part of the county. So thank you guys for being here and representing our community. Our next presentation is water safety skit number one. So we have several water safety skits here uh, to present to you today from Little Lamb Fire Department, Lake Town Clowns. Kevo, or Kevo, and Coco, right? Yes, sir. All right, bring it on, boy. We don't, we usually don't do podiums, so. Uh, as Jim said, my name's Kevo, this is Coco. Uh, we're with the Little Army Fire Department. Uh, I'm a battalion, and he's the fire fire paramedic, so. I won't give you our real names because we got to keep that identity. But uh, we were going to do a little skit real quick, but uh, instead we're going to kind of explain what we do and what we bring to the table. Um, so there's nine of us that are a part of our program. Uh, like I said, it's all our volunteers. None of us are really voluntold or, you know, we don't have to do.
to this, but it's something that we're passionate about. Uh, so like I said, nine of us from different ranks, but we don't have ranks in our group. So uh, we're under the direction of our fire chief, uh, Brian Roach. So that's who we report to. Uh, he's also a fire marshal. Uh, so basically, uh, for the last 12 years, 13 years, that uh, Rock, uh, Coco and I have been part of this, uh, routinely during October is fire safety month, so that's when we go to all the schools, mostly the elementary schools here in Little Island. Uh, we do a couple schools for Frisco just because they're in our response district uh, in a way. Uh, so right now we actually do nine schools, uh, so that's approximately 18 shows that we do for our kids. Uh, and kind of like, uh, I think it was Hill, uh, the mayor was talking about the weather. Um, the way that we do our shows and we prepare for it is we listen to little keywords. And so for him, uh, he made that comment about Texas weather and he kept on talking, talking about the sand and hopefully we bring sand into our house and that type of stuff. Well, so we pick up on those little keywords and so when we do a show or we build a show, that's what we base it off of. So as you can see, uh, yeah, we have our clown makeup and stuff, but we're kind of dressed up in our little life, our lifeguard outfits and stuff. So, you know, if we were to put on a show right now, it would be basically water safety because we know that we're getting into the months of where most of our incidents is going to be down at the beach or it's going to be on the lake. So uh, we would definitely do stuff about like life jacket safety, buddy swimming, that type of stuff. So, but for our kiddos and for October, the fire safety month, uh, NFDA puts out a big standard or a big uh, subject, I guess that you could call it. And so it might be, uh, don't forget to check your smoke detectors. And so we actually, we build a show, which is usually anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes over basically smoke detectors and checking your smoke detectors and that type of stuff. Um, we don't always dress up as clowns when we do it. Um, we do superheroes. Um, a couple of principals were in here a while ago. We did uh, Batman and Robin last year. Uh, which was a big hit with the kids. And so normally what we do is we see what one of the hot movies that's coming out at that time and that we know that the kids are gonna enjoy. And that's who our characters are. Um, the clowns have always been in the fire prevention. And you know, if y'all know a few years ago, we had kind of a clown scare where everybody was scared of clowns. And actually there were some ISDs that didn't want the clowns in their school. And so now we're taken away from our, our kids in that sense. So, uh, but we were already ahead of that, so we were, like I said, we were already doing the character, so it was no big deal. We were able to continue with our shows, but, um, so, but you can say we're bringing back our clowns a little bit, but we're still going to do characters as far as, you know, I might be Batman, but I'm going to have my Kevo face on because the kids are going to know who Kevo is. And so, uh, but like I said, we do nine shows, or nine schools right now. Um, we've kind of been in that room for, uh, I don't know, 12, 13 years now. And so we want to get back to the city. We see what the city's doing for us. We see what our our leaders for, you know, not all our department, but our city's doing. And so we <coughs> sat down this year and we're going to expand our program. Uh, we're actually going to start doing uh, PSAs. Uh, so we talked about doing approximately three to four PSAs a year. Uh, not only are we going to reach out to our senior, uh, center, senior citizen center and do skits there. We've done them in the past. We just don't do them regularly. Uh, we do a uh, like overdose type thing to make sure you know you're marking your your medication that type of stuff. So we'll actually dress up as old people, older people. Uh, so uh, we're gonna go to what we are getting at. Where am I? At? Like six. I'm at six already. Doing? Uh, so like I said, we're gonna expand a little bit. Uh, we're gonna start doing stuff down at our amphitheater for the kids, for family members who aren't a part of the ISD. Like I said, we get a lot of people that come from other communities, so we're gonna be down there, and so we're gonna put on skits. We're gonna do water safety skits so the kids know, you know, not to jump in the water head first, and then you, you know, jump in their feet first, that type of stuff. So um, other than that, later on, we'll actually do a few little skits, but, and then, uh, you know, well, basically that's what we do. So any questions, comments, concerns? We're done? Our noses are not real. No, they're not real. We're good? Thank you. You bet. I just thought you had a cold. Thank you guys and from the uh, Little Empire Park for uh, giving us that presentation. Our next is our federal keynote speaker for today. 
Uh, he is the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. That's Dr. Kevin Yeski, and his presentation today is uh, Health and Human Services' Role in Disaster Preparedness and Response to Las Vegas Shootings, as well as Hurricane Harvey. With that, Doctor, thank you for being here. Good morning, and uh, thanks for the uh, opportunity to participate in the uh, Preparedness Summit, and thanks for Congressman Burgess for uh, extending the invitation for us to come down in and participate in the, in the conference. But uh, can everyone hear me in the back? Is that better? Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a couple of different things today. I'm going to give you a little bit of a rundown on what the uh, office that I work for does at the federal level and then talk about uh, some observations we made. We had the opportunity to go out to Las Vegas after the shooting, a couple months after the shooting, and speak with the healthcare providers out there and talk about some of the lessons learned that they, uh, they had from that event, the, the disastrous event, and try and translate that into something that we can all take back home to any community to uh, better prepare for those kind of uh, horrible events. And then talk uh, about what the Department of Health and Human Services did during the uh, past hurricane season with a focus on what's being, being done, still being done in Texas, and then you know what we, uh, what we did in the uh, response phase and then in the recovery phase. Again, perspective at the federal level than uh, you do at the local level. We have to worry about the larger events and knowing full well that most of the, uh, the local events are going to be handled with, uh, with great uh, skill and, and uh, uh, competency uh, for the smaller events. But at the, at the ASPR level, we have to think about those events that cross jurisdictions that may affect larger parts of the nation and kind of the, you know, the, the things that, that we don't think will happen in our lifetime that end up doing. Uh, you know, we're, we're all worried about the different threats that are out there. We call them 21st century threats because they're a little bit different. They're a little bit more intense. And, uh, you know, you think about uh, some of the uh, some of the threats that we face from state nation, state-sponsored uh, terrorism, and all the things in uh, the, the Korean Peninsula look uh, optimistic. We still have to, you know, consider that there's there, there are countries out there that have nuclear weapons and the ability to deliver them. Uh, overseas as well as domestically. We just came out of a hurricane season that had literally three of the strongest storms across the Atlantic Ocean uh, of all time, and they happened within a one month period. So we had to respond in different areas to those strong storms. Uh, we worry about shootings, we worry about chemical weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. We worry about large infectious diseases like pandemic influenza, which we had in the 2010, 2011 time frame. And then uh, something that we really haven't worried about that much until recently is cybersecurity. When you think about some of the medical devices that we use in our hospitals and at home, that those devices can be hacked, turned on and turned off and controlled by entities outside of the people who are actually using them. So we, those, those are the kind of considerations we have to deal with at the federal level. And again, at the local level, we know you deal with those, but you know, as I talked to Julie really earlier about local threats here, it's, wildfires, severe weather, things like that. Those are the most immediate threats that, that you worry about at the local level. Our perspective is that plus some of these other larger threats. So our office was set up after Katrina. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, the federal response, particularly the medical response was disjointed. It was uncoordinated. And while it was reasonably effective, it could have been better. It could have been more efficient. And so the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response was put together to coordinate the federal health response uh, system. And the, the Department of Defense went through this uh, uh, earlier in their, their history in trying to coordinate how the, the services, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, fed into combatant commands. And that was part of the Goldwater Nichols Act, where they coordinated the services activities to support combatant commands. And that's what our office does. We coordinate the federal health responses so we can, we can put those uh, 
resources in the field in response in a coordinated and effective way. So our mission is, is pretty basic, is to save lives and protect Americans from 21st century health threats. So our priorities provide strong leadership, and this is not just our priorities. We view these as national priorities in, in some regard. Strong leadership, exactly what you're seeing here today, where people are taking leadership approaches to getting communities prepared and building resistance, pulling together multiple partners in this, in this effort, and trying to get together so there's communications and there's coordination, and people know one another prior to an event, rather than just getting to know one another during an event. We support the public health security uh, if, uh, capacity, the ability to set up vaccination centers or medi medication distribution points uh, during pandemics and other infectious disease events, uh, getting together to uh, work on hurricane response or tornado response, uh, and making sure that our public health capacity is, is, is solid and, and uh, working effectively. We have a large role in what medical countermeasures are used for some of these terrorist events, and we have an organization within NASA called the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. And what we do there is we sponsor uh, pharmaceutical companies that take candidate medical countermeasure uh, entities and help them go from the basic clinical uh, development all the way through licensure uh, from the FDA and put in our strategic national stockpile. So we have medical countermeasures that we need uh, should, should we have to use them in an in, uh, in event. And then our regional disaster health response system is really what we're trying to do is build a clear regional response to threats that cross jurisdictions and we're trying to eliminate those, those bureaucratic and administrative boundaries that slow us down in our response. And essentially we're, we're trying to build a national system, not just a federal system. So a couple of questions. And we, we believe this is a shared responsibility. That it's not just a federal, it's not just a state, it's not just a local, but it's a, it's a, it's a shared responsibility to be, to be prepared and to be ready. And it begins with individuals. And then, then it goes to families, then it goes to neighborhoods and communities, and counties, states, and, and all the way up to regions at the federal level. But individuals have to be prepared to respond. And I noticed uh, out in the, in the display area that your health department has a, uh, has a guide booklet on family preparedness and individual preparedness. And it's a really good book to, to go through and review. It wants a checklist in here on what you need to do to do essentially one of two things, shelter in place or evacuate. And you need to be able to do both of those depending on the threats. And you need to be able to tap into the communication system so your local authorities can advise you on what to do. And your emergency management agency in, in the county has a, uh, an alert system that you can sign up for that will blast out alerts and, and tell you what to do and advise you what to do. And that's critically important so you're able to do the, uh, the right thing at the appropriate time. But anyways, uh, let's see if we can help So you have a communications plan and a response plan? Raise your hand if you have one at home. Good, most of you do. Most of you do. How about the next slide? How about who's here taking a CPR course or a stop the bleed course? How about just stop the bleed? Okay. Some, but not many. Tourniquets work. When I trained in, in, in medical school and in, in my residency and practice, tourniquets were bad. Don't use tourniquets, don't put them on. They save lives, and they save lives in a pre hospital. And when I talk about Las Vegas, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So the next slide. How about taking care of your neighbors? I used to, when I lived in Maryland, we, we got snowstorms, and every snowstorm, we'd go over and knock on our neighbor's door. She was an 80 some year old lady who lived by herself. We made sure she had food, made sure her, her heat was on, things like that. Or if she didn't have that, we would, we would get it for her. But, you know, across the street, on either side of your house, that's part of the community resilience that we need to build. So again, I'm, I'm I work for the federal government, but it's so important to talk about individual and community preparedness and resilience. That's where it starts. And I'll state the obvious, but the fact is, is we as feds 
support the states and the locals, and we do a better job when the states and locals do a better job. And when we have to come in and do everything, that slows down our response. That slows down our ability to provide that support. But if we can build on infrastructure that already exists, the preparedness that already exists, then we can do more for you and get you, you know, get the response through and get the recovery well underway. So, with that in mind, let's talk about Las Vegas. In Ashford, we have a program called the Hospital Preparedness Program, and we give state health departments funding to get their hospitals prepared. And we do that through hospital coalitions, which are some state regional coalitions of healthcare facilities. A coalition is two or more hospitals, emergency medical services, emergency management, and public health working together in the community to build that level of preparedness. And we do that, we do that nationwide, 50 states, territories, uh, to, to do that. On October 1st in Las Vegas at a, at a concert, again, you're, you're, all of you are familiar with this uh, scenario, uh, about 22,000 attendees are on a seven or eight acre site, about maybe a quarter of a mile away from the airport and then from the Mandalay Bay Hotel. And uh, someone from the, from the hotel started firing into the crowd and using uh, military type weapons. Usually military type, but lots of weapons, lots of shots fired. Uh, about 600 people were treated at the local hospitals and uh, a small percent of that was transported by emergency medical services. Right? So lots of patients, lots of people with severe head injuries, chest injuries, abdominal injuries, and orthopedic injuries with vascular. These are these were very injured people. These are the type of, type of injuries you see in military combat. And a lot of hospitals aren't, aren't used to seeing that, even the level of trauma centers. They're just not familiar with seeing that, that, that those types of injuries. Now, as, we, as we've seen in other events like this, most of the patients were taken by, not, not ambulance, not EMS, but by private vehicles or walked or were carried to the closest facilities. And what, that, what happens with that is that ends up with a mismatch of the care that's needed versus the ability of those facilities to deliver that, that care. So they were taken to places that didn't have neurosurgeons, taking a place where they could only handle a few uh, trauma cases, not this vast majority. And the trauma center, which was a couple miles away, did not get the bulk of the patients. Other facilities did. But the other important thing is that EMS, emergency medical services, did not transport those patients because it was just an open perimeter and it took a time for them to get in. People pulled out their cell phones, hit on their smartphones around me, they showed the hospitals, and they took them to those facilities. Next slide. So you have back up at the hospitals, yeah. so one hospital received in literally 30 minutes, almost 200, 200 uh, trauma patients in, in their emergency department. And the trauma center received 160 some, and again, sick people. But the fortunate thing was, this was a change of shift. So the outgoing staff was still there, and the oncoming staff was still there, so they had double shift staff there, which enabled them to have some capacity to manage all these, all these patients. They did wonders. The, the, the medical teams did wonders at all of these hospitals. Three million hospitals saw the bulk of the patients, although there, was, there, were other, there were other hospitals that saw them. They performed surgeries, 60 some surgeries overnight at some of the facilities, major cases. They were able to make space in their hospitals. They were able to take care of these patients. And did they follow the rules? If you, had a, if you had a textbook for managing these patients, did they follow those? No, but they were innovative, they were creative, and they, they did what needed to be done. And so what worked for them? Number one, people pitching in, that pe pediatric surgeons operating on adults, something that they don't routinely do. They had anesthesia, uh, managing multiple cases, things like that. So they, they all pitched in, they, they did that kind of stuff. Uh, but, but, you know, a, a couple things that, that, that were universally uh, a lesson learned out of, out of this was one is you, you have to you have to have effective triage of patients I'm trying to figure out which patients get to the OR first and, and how they do that and a lot of that is based on military triage there are a couple of docs in each of the hospitals that had military training some of the hospitals had military surgeons there working so they were able to apply those battlefield battlefield rules 
to get those patients who needed the, the care at, a, at first to get them into the uh, facilities. Communications. Las Vegas has private EMS, they have public EMS in multiple jurisdictions. They have some county, they have some city. Uh, communication across those systems uh, could, could have been better. And we see that. I mean, we see that almost everywhere we go where, there's, where these, these events don't respect jurisdictional boundaries and you have issues with protocols and procedures and communications and things like that. So that, that's important. Uh, emergency medical services. Again, being, being unable to get all the patients to the hospitals could have been able to transport patients and distribute those patients out a little bit better to some of the other hospitals that could have taken care of the, the lesser injured patients. And being, you know, EMS usually takes it from point of injury to the hospital. They don't do that inner hospital movement that much. So that's a, that's a protocol uh, that, that needs to be uh, implemented. But what really worked was the use of tourniquets. A lot of patients came in with tourniquets on their extremities, applied to their extremities to stop the bleeding from these devastating injuries. And these were, these were civilians who put these tourniquets on. These were EMS providers, other first responders. These were civilians who understood the, understood the use of tourniquets and put them on. Not all of them were perfect, but the, the, the civilian bystanders got those tourniquets, tourniquets on and saved lives. That's, that's a pretty powerful statement. And tourniquets are easy to use. It's, we're not talking about a sophisticated medical procedure. It's not as hard as CPR to apply a tourniquet. It's a simple procedure that if you learn how to do it right, you can save lives. If you look at some of the videos from the scene, you'll, you'll see people who don't have their shirts on. Think, well, you know, we're off on their country, Western concert, stuff like that. People took their shirts off to put on tourniquets. They use them as tourniquets. So I can't, I can't emphasize the importance of learning how to use a, use a tourniquet. It can, it can save lives. People can bleed out within minutes. <coughs> the, other, the other thing I want to mention is, with all these events, is the component of disaster behavioral health and the, the, the behavioral health and the mental health impacts that these events have on providers as well as uh, the, the casualties of these events. And you know, we, we went to the hospital, we talked to people, and you could, we, we talked to them probably six months after the event, and you can still see that some of these, these emotions and the, the impact that, that it had on the hospital providers was still fresh. They were still impacted by that, and they had gone through the, you know, the proper mental health, uh, psychological first aid and things like that. But it's important, and we talked, you know, I had a panel up here about the, uh, from the schools earlier, and being able to, when an event happens and look at children and figure out how they're dealing with this. So kids don't necessarily process things the way that adults do. And they may be having bad dreams and not doing well in school and having other behavioral disruptions that may not manifest like it would in an adult. And then you think about it and kids get, you know, if you watch TV, it's like a continual loop of this event happens, they show it again, they show it again, they show it again, they show it again. As adults, we recognize that's one event. But kids watch that and they say, what? Well, it's just happening again and again, and there's 10 events or there's 15 events. And they don't recognize it. It's the same thing being played over. So you really have to be mindful about behavioral health impact, particularly on kids. And it strikes me, I have an 11-year-old son. Last year, we were at the movies, and it, you know, in the theaters, they always say, in case of emergency, here's the exit, go to the exit, go to the exit. And my son looks up at me and says, Dad, the bad guys going to come in here and shoot us. You know, we live in a small rural Pennsylvania. We don't get much of this, but there's, there's enough of it that shows up on TV, and they do the drills in school, like you do the drills. But it's just, I mean, it's just that's the way they process that. So that resulted in a long conversation with him about, you know, what to do, and how, to, how to respond, and how to be prepared. And this is why they're doing that, doing that in the movie theater. So, but it impacts kids and it impacts adults in different ways. There's a couple useful aids for behavioral health. One is our National Disaster Distress Helpline. And you can, you can see the numbers up there. We use that a lot in disasters, and we get a lot of use out of that in disasters from HHS and our Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. 
And we have some other ways to get information out because, again, getting information out is important. And there's multiple ways to get it, but it's not always accurate. There's always the fog of, fog of war after, after an event. and trying to get accurate information, mostly from your local uh, disaster or your emergency management agencies. But we have the ability to put information out, and best practices, and there's multiple different sections for that, our technical resources uh, area in Tracy, as for Tracy. Uh, we have an assistance center and we have an information exchange. Uh, the first one, the technical uh, resources area, we could just type uh, <coughs> Google Ask for Tracy, you'll come into our website, and you can get information you need on that. So I recommend when you go home sometime this week is you, you just get familiar with this. There's lots of very good information on disaster response and preparedness there. Some other uh, mass violence resource examples program so again this is uh, some other useful information I will like to spend a minute or two talking about a program we developed called empower and our healthcare landscapes changing there's less emphasis on inpatient care and more emphasis on outpatient care we have a lot of people living in the community who are on durable medical equipment like ventilators we have a lot of people now with chronic diseases in fact our disaster medical systems teams when we responded to the three hurricanes this past fall, a lot of what we saw in our medical tents weren't acute injuries, but they were the uh, complications of chronic medical illnesses where people ran out of medications, where they weren't able to seek care, and they came in for chronic problems. So we had to, we had to change our, our response profile a little bit to be able to take care of those, those types of patients more. Uh, but our power system is we were able to get uh, CMS databases and look at those databases and identify people who like dialysis patients, people who have durable medical equipment, and proactively before a storm, identify those people and contact them and help evacuate them. We did that a lot in, in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands after Hurricane Maria to work with our urban search and rescue partners to evacuate those folks before the storm. Because after the storm, it's, it's really hard to do that, and particularly with dialysis patients, it's critical that they get the dialysis they need every couple of days. So, what do we do in, in ASPR during a response? First of all, we support state locals. Your governor, through FEMA, requests our services. So we don't, we just don't come in. We may pre-deploy, but that's at the governor's request to assist. We work with our federal partners, FEMA, uh, we work closely with at the regional level and then at the federal level. Other partners we work with are the Veterans Administration. They have facilities and they have capabilities that, that, that they work with us and the Department of Defense. And they're strong partners with, with us on a, lot of, on a lot of our responses. And uh, you know, they, they provide medical, medical care and medical resources and logistics that, that we don't otherwise have. So we do public health, and our, we have 17 functions in the national response framework that we do under our emergency support function. Everything from risk communications, to environmental health, to water safety, to drug safety, to an, animal health, to human health, and public health. We have a, a, a wide swath of responsibilities that we, we, uh, we undertake in response. Our programs, we have a national disaster medical system, Texas has a couple of teams. Texas 4 is in this area, and they, they were uh, you know, a key team that was responded during the, the, during the hurricanes uh, here in, in Puerto Rico and in Florida. So we, we value their support and, and what they do because they're volunteers. They take their time to, to volunteer for us. Go uh, ahead. Uh, so they're, they're the public health part. We work with CDC and other public health organizations take care of the, the public health uh, uh, needs that, that arise from this. Uh, our Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration assists us with behavioral health needs, and then we work with the Department of Agriculture and our veterinary teams to provide care for animals and, uh, and shelters and, and places like that. So, wide, wide set of functions. Uh, next slide. Our regional coordinators, we have uh, regional coordinators in each of our 10 regions couple of attendants today and uh, they, they work with uh, 
state local planners and emergency management agencies and public health agencies to coordinate efforts. So we look at where we can be supportive. We know those in advance. And then when something happens, we're able to assist with, with that, uh, that response. Okay. We're going to talk about our, our health care coalitions. We'll go into that anymore because we're running out of time here. But uh, again, we try and bring the whole health care piece in along with our public health partners and our emergency managers to assist us in developing those coalitions. So what work? Texas has a strong has a strong coalition system, and the, the, the regional coalition that helped us during the, the Harvey floods was the uh, Southeast Texas Regional Advisory uh, uh, Council, and they coordinated the healthcare response for uh, for Houston and the, the surrounding areas, and we supported them. Uh, they're very very active in that. Our national disaster medical assistance teams uh, took care of acute care. We set up what we call federal medical stations took care of chronic care uh, patients, and uh, I'll show some numbers here in a minute. And then we also uh, help transfer patients. Uh, patients needed moved or uh, hospitals had to evacuate. We helped with uh, with Department of Defense and Veterans Administration support to help get those patients moved. We can go to the next one. So we had about 1,600 people deployed, medical providers, and support staff to do that. We treated uh, in our facilities about uh, 5,500 patients. Uh, a large logistical effort supported that activity. And uh, again, through FEMA funding under the Stafford Act and their, their cooperation, uh, those are mission assignments, that's what uh, the funding we get to provide our teams and our support for that. After the response, we had a recovery uh, team down here, and they're, they're just finishing up now. So we've been assisting with recovery and helping. Uh, the, the Houston area and surrounding areas get back up to uh, back up to normal, maybe even better than normal. So uh, we, we, we should be winding that up uh, almost six months after the after the hurricanes. So we have a short first where we respond, but in the in the recovery period, we're here for the duration. We we won't leave until the governor and the local say, okay, you're done. We're, we we think we got it, uh, and, and we get out of the way. So I think that. My last slide. If you if you want to see more of what we do, you can check out the phe.gov. That's probably the, the easiest reference, and that will refer you to all the other other links here that you see up on the, on the slide. So with that, I will stop and uh, look forward to your questions uh, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Yeski. Appreciate you coming down from Washington D.C. And, and joining us today for a prepared to spirit. Our next speaker is. Mr. Tony Robinson, he's a regional administrator for FEMA Region 6 right here in Denton. So thank you, Tony, for coming up. Appreciate it. Give me a second. I'm going to put out some props here. Because uh, I'm the federal guy that's following the clowns. So uh, I just want to keep my props out of here. I didn't bring the written nose, though. Um, Just want to start a little bit. Uh, I am the administrator of our Denton office. We're located in Denton. 
So FEMA has a fairly significant footprint here in the North Texas area. We've got the regional headquarters in, located in Denton, Texas, up by the Department of Public Safety, <coughs> number 88. We also have a, a uh, call center located in Denton behind the Lowe's there. That's where they take uh, all of the toll-free calls for people who have, are registering for assistance. So they do that there. We've got two other facilities uh, on the East Coast and West Coast. And then we have a logistics center in Fort Worth that stores a lot of the commodities that we send out, some generator, cots, blankets, uh, some meals. We store those in Fort Worth so we can quickly get those out to the damaged area. And then we've got satellite offices from my office in New Orleans and Baton Rouge that are still working. Some of the legacy disasters there, Katrina, Rita, Gustav, and Ike. And we are getting ready to set up an office in Austin and Houston to be able to take care of the ongoing efforts from Hurricane Harvey so that we can focus on that effort and get some of our response staff ready for hurricane season. Anybody know how many days it is to hurricane season? It's roughly 37 days from today to June 1st, start of the hurricane season. So it's just around the corner. So you say, what does that mean to Denton? Jody and his group here do a fantastic job. You've got some great emergency managers. Texas has great uh, emergency management staff throughout the state, but these guys do a great job of supporting those coastal jurisdictions that maybe have to evacuate. And you guys have how many people down in Dallas who will help support shelters there and spread throughout the uh, Dallas Fort Worth area last year? Yeah. So once again, significant effort here to, to help support those local jurisdictions. So emergency management is all about that. People, coordination, helping one another. So the locals, while we may not be in a hurricane threat, will certainly bring people in from that affected area and be able to shelter and house them. All right, I think the next, uh, we've got a video in there that we're gonna play that, because I can tell you what we did in hurricane season. We had a video that was done for our staff and it kind of showed the response from Hurricanes Harvey, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria and the, uh, that looks like a movie to start, I don't know if we're going to play. Yeah. I'm not sure, I'll see it in the video. Okay, well, uh, the, what the video really showed was the challenges of the 2017 hurricane season. So we had Harvey, Irma, Maria all strike within the 30 day period from August 25th through September 20th. Significant operation for us. We had done some catastrophic planning, the agency had helped bad day for us is a million people trying to apply for federal assistance. We had about five million people in those disasters trying to register and apply for our system. So it really did put a tax on our system. But what we quickly learned was we had to count on local emergency managers, state emergency managers, everybody doing their job to be able to help us. And that's what I would tell you in emergency management. It is a coordination. Once again, FEMA's not a responder, but we are a coordinator. Uh, the local governments, the state governments do a phenomenal job here in Texas, and they really are, it's a locally executed, state managed, uh, and, and then federally supported. As Dr. Gesky said, FEMA doesn't just come in. We clearly work with the Department of Public Safety, Texas Division of Emergency Management, to coordinate our efforts to pre aid, but the governor has to request FEMA's assistance in order for us to come into an event. I'll just, this is the 2017, uh, Hurricane season, you had 48 states that responded by, by sending assistance here. And so what you saw in Houston, you had uh, state fire officials uh, bringing their boats, you had private citizens with their boats, you had the private sector donating boats all coming together to provide the resources to be able to rescue those individuals who were in the 50 inches of rain there. 70 volunteer organizations uh, supporting uh, with equipment supplies. You see some of that out here in the parking lot. It's feeding. We have some great volunteer organizations throughout the country that come out and help us. Here you see, uh, we go back over five million calls. We had a program where uh, the housing stock. So Harvey really for us was kind of three events in one. You had a Category Four storm that hit the Rockport Fulton area on the, on the Texas coast. Then you had the storm meander up into the Houston metro area, set there for seven days, up over 51 inches of rain. No one ever thought they'd get 51 inches of rain in seven days. We're going to talk a little about what you can do to prepare for that. And then you had the storm then moved off into the Beaumont, Port Arthur area up in Louisiana with over 15 inches of rain in a short period of time and tropical storm force winds. So really a, a wide geographic area, about 41,000 square miles, bigger than the state of South Carolina, was impacted by Hurricane Harvey. And so we have to go out and do home inspections to verify damages. So we did over 2 million home inspections. 
about 8% of the population was impacted by the hurricanes. If you add in the wildfires, about 15% of the U.S. population was impacted by the 2017 hurricanes in the California wildfire. And then about 9.6 million paid out in national flood insurance program claims. Next slide. This is just a graphic of, of the Texas only the Hurricane Harvey recovery. Uh, a couple things that I want to draw your attention is over here on this side of the screen. Is, is FEMA runs a individual assistance program. So if your home is damaged, we look at covering the non-insured uh, critical needs. So that's basically getting you into a place that is safe and secure for you to live and then providing some either money for rental assistance if you can't get back into your home and then some, some uh, a small amount of money for contents. We are limited by our authorities that we cannot exceed $33,000 in assistance. So if you look at that and, 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 and compare, and Harvey, our average payout to people who suffered damage was between four and $7,000. The National Flood Insurance Program's average payment to those who flooded was about $89,000. So think about that. You're going to recover much better if you've got if you're insured for the peril versus if you're just counting solely on federal assistance because it is very limited for essential needs uh, to get you back to a safe and secure environment. So I cannot uh, talk enough about the insurance that as part of our preparedness planning. We really need everybody to look at what is your threats, risks, and hazards. I think Dent County does a great job of promoting that. Um, and, and then what does your insurance coverage say about that? And over time, we've seen the insurance industry kind of change. So they've got named storm deductibles that may be higher than if it's a non-named storm. So if you're on the coast and it's a named hurricane, that may cause a different deductible. So almost like your health checkup. What we encourage you is every year, take a look at your insurance. Get your insurance health checkup to know what you're covered for. You go back, you go back. The, the Small Business Administration involves our programs. And so if you apply for FEMA assistance, if you've got the ability to pay back a loan, you will be uh, referred to the Small Business Administration. So a lot of people see that and say, well, I'm not a business. I don't want to take that loan. But they are very vital in providing low interest loans to help people get back on their feet. And those loans can go up to $200,000, once again, much greater latitude than what we have in our FEMA programs. The National Flood, flood Insurance uh, Program paid out uh, $8.6 billion. And the uh, National Flood Insurance Program with, with over 91000 Claims. So once again, our message here is we really need to make sure as part of your preparedness plan is, is close that insurance gap and make sure you're covered for the peril that, that may be out there. The, the other piece is in the middle, we do a public assistance program and then mitigation. Uh, so we've got about $1.1 billion after the event that we're working with the state of Texas to mitigate. So these areas that have repetitive loss flooding, these areas that maybe we want to buy people out, if this is their fourth or fifth time flood, we can work with those local, local jurisdictions working through the states, help them mitigate that and, and uh, hopefully move people out of harm's way. Public assistance, that's where we provide money through the state to the local governments. So they have a lot of debris. They move 12 million cubic yards of debris. That is a lot of debris. We've got to look at how do we properly uh, plan for that so we're not filling up landfill and taking up 10 years. So how do we reduce that? How do we do that properly? But that's really critical to get the recovery because people want to get that debris, get their homes mucked and gutted out, and then start the recovery process. So that debris process is really important. Next slide. So here is uh, uh, the flood risk for Texas. About 1.7 million people live in, in the 1% annual chance of, of flood hazards. And, and one of the things we get people really focused on that number, you can buy flood insurance regardless of where you live. One of the myths we've heard over and over again, the 2016 Louisiana floods, uh, and, and the Hurricane Harvey was, I didn't live in a special flood hazard area. My mortgage company doesn't require me to buy flood insurance. Therefore, I don't get it. I can't get it. Anybody can get flood insurance. Actually, if you do not live in a special flood hazard area, it's much lower. So we really do encourage about 40% of the people in, in the Louisiana floods and in Hurricane Harvey did not live in a special flood hazard area. And they didn't think they'd ever see 51 inches of rain. But it, it did occur and they flooded and didn't have flood insurance and that recovery process is much, much more difficult without being covered for insurance. There's state owned structures. We're having that same conversation with our, our state local partners, the governmental entities that are out there. Buildings can be insured and we've got to make sure that they look at how they can uh, insure those public facilities. Next slide. 
So uh, I'm glad you're all here. I think this is a great event. A lot of great vendors out there. Please go see them. That's probably the most important thing here. Talk about preparedness. Uh, Jody and Denton County have a great website. You can sign up for alerts so that you know what's going on. But I want to also say this weekend is sales tax holiday. So what a great way if you've got a kit, that's great. You might need to do some updates. I just brought a few things out of the kit that I own. First aid kit, very important. Pull this out. Anybody know what that is? You can, you can break out a car window, but it's also a tool that helps me turn off the gas meter. So one of the things we see, you talk to the fire department, that's one area that when you have a tornado or something that in, impacts homes, this gas becomes an issue. So do you know how to turn off your gas meter? Do you have the right tool to do that? This is just a hand little tool that we kind of recommend being every emergency preparedness kit. And then, uh, Know, know what this is? It's a radio. A AM FM radio, but a weather radio. This has a weather channel, so I can, once again, if the power goes out, battery operated, has a hand crank on here, that if my cell phone goes dead, I can use this to help charge my cell phone. Because most people we find out, we become so reliant on these, if you lose this, how many of you have numbers up here in your head that says, I know how to get home with my kids, I know what their school, the phone number for their school, would find them if there's an event that impacts them while they're in school. So we encourage you to Put those somewhere in your wallet, in your purse, so you have those with them. But you can also have a tool like this to help charge your battery and the electricity's out. These are great little tools that are out there and available and would be available in, on a tax holiday that is occurring. Uh, so on your way home, maybe go stop by there on the, the controller's website, has uh, the information on what is uh, what is allowable this weekend and what is not. But this is a great thing that the state of Texas is doing to get people prepared, and we certainly encourage you all to take advantage of it. Next slide. So lessons learned from uh, Hurricane Harvey. Once again, success starts with a prepared citizen. And so when people were prepared, and in Harvey, once again, what we saw was it was neighbor helping neighbor, the local community, the local police, fire, were very well trained, very well skilled, and worked together and were able to get out there and help lives. We came in later and, and assisted. We have a, a search and rescue teams within FEMA that are local. Uh, police and firemen who work every day at the local level at a disaster, we can federalize them and bring them into an area. We've got 28 teams throughout the country. Probably one of the most experienced and best teams is Texas Task Force One out of the Bryan College Station area. Next slide. Next slide. That? Yes, sir. So that's it. Pretty quick and simple. What I'd leave you with once again is the better you're prepared, it leaves for Jody and his team local police, local fire, to look at the most vulnerable population. So that's our message to you, is the citizen prepare is going to help us all in emergency management. FEMA does not do it alone. You heard Dr. Yesterday earlier, we have a, uh, we're a coordinating entity, so we can coordinate with other federal agencies like the Department of Health and Human Services, Bureau of Engineers, and, and we use all the federal family to bring, to work with our state partners, work at the local level to figure out what their needs and resources are, and, and get the right resource at the right time to be able to take care of their needs. So, any questions? Thank you very much. I probably thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure to be a, a friend and, and having him as a colleague from the federal perspective to be able to reach out as a from a local community right to your regional uh, coordinator in Region 6 there in Denton. And he serves, how many states do you serve? We serve the Boston area, Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Mexico, and the 68 that travel federally recognized tribes in that area. I would also mention that we do have a FEMA booth out here. Our ready.gov website is a great source of information for you to get preparedness information as well as going to the Denton County website. We also have the ability out here to look up your address to tell you where you are in the floodplains here in the Denton area, or little known area, wherever you're from. And then we also have a flood table that kind of will show you the impacts of flooding. So I encourage you to stop by and kind of look at that demonstration, really kind of brings home that point of what water can do to your home if you're not prepared for it. Thank you again. Uh, it's a pleasure to have our federal partners with us today. And again, thank you, Dr. Yeski, for being here today and safe travels back to, to Washington, D.C. Our next presentation, real quickly, is uh, to move to community. We, we addressed our federal partners 
And now we're going to look at our local community perspective. And with that, we have how was your community prepared to respond and recover from crisis situation? And that is with your local emergency management coordinator, Travis Calendine. He represents the town of Little Elm as well as uh, the city of the colony. So, Travis, welcome to your own town. I know. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, I appreciate everyone that comes out to this event. It's a very uh, a, a great event to come to, especially uh, this time of the year. Uh, we always want to focus on getting our community and our residents and even our surrounding residents uh, prepared for uh, severe weather and or emergencies. It's an important uh, uh, aspect of living in North Central Texas here uh, that, that you can't avoid. So, uh, you know, don't, don't fight it, uh, embrace it, and, uh, and, and learn how to be prepared uh, as, as a resident and, and to help your, you and your family and your co-workers. A couple of things I'd like to highlight uh, to ensure that you're prepared is uh, some of the, our federal partners and other uh, states, it's the same thing. Do you have a plan? Make sure you and your family have a plan. Do you have a communications plan? Do you have a reunification plan? Something simple, uh, what happens if your cell phones go down? How are you gonna communicate with each other? Think, think things of that nature are very important. Uh, another thing I can't help stress is having a emergency preparedness kit for you and your family. Uh, it's very important to have one of those because uh, because of you need to be able to have uh, supplies for approximately 72 hours in case uh, we have a major ca uh, a major uh, storm or some sort of emergency come through our area and you have to sustain yourself for that amount of time. Um, there are many different ways. Uh, that you can prepare yourself with a kit. Uh, there's a lot of literature on the internet. You can Google it. Uh, we've got some wonderful information up on the top side there. Uh, but uh, food, water, uh, gloves, helmets, you know, things that will help you uh, keep yourself safe if you have in the event of a severe weather or if you have to go to your safe room. One of the big things I like to tell a lot of our residents, uh, especially, is where is your safe room at? Is it your bathroom? Is it under your stairs? Is it some place that's the most interior of, of your room, of, of your home, or your business, and uh, some place where you have supplies? One thing that um, that happens is a lot of times is people forget to prepare their safe room with shoes, gloves, and eye protection, things of that nature. Because if you ever were to go, if you ever have a some sort of be trapped, for, you know, hopefully it won't happen. But if you were, you have straight line winds or, or some severe weather tornado uh, were to come through the area and your house has been destroyed and, and, and you make it through your safe room, how do you get out? So it's important to have some of those uh, materials with you to make sure you are, are ready to get out and that you are protecting yourself, especially having shoes. And a lot of times the stuff happens in the middle of the night, so it's very important. Uh, again, there uh, there's chances where you know this widespread, widespread catastrophic event that you're gonna to have to uh, help yourself. Neighbor helping neighbor, just as was presented before. Down in Harvey, neighbors were helping each other, they were sustaining each other and things of that nature. So it's very important to have uh, all that stuff ready to go. Uh, another uh, important part is being weather aware, uh, especially this time of year. Uh, you're gonna hear it again from my partners from the Weather Service and uh, NBC5 showed up, but it's important, especially uh, really all, all times of the year living in Texas, you need to be weather, weather aware. Uh, we had tornadoes in uh, Dallas and uh, Garland and Rawlett a couple years ago. That was the day after Christmas. So we had, uh, we had humidity, we had 80 degree weather, we had tornadoes, and then the panhandle, you had a blizzard going on. So it's important to know your weather uh, in Texas, be weather aware and have, uh, know what's going on. But to have that, you want to have multiple ways of being weather aware. Don't uh, have your favorite news station, have your favorite uh, app, uh, internet information, uh, things of that nature, have multiple ways and, 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 pick, and, and pick one of those uh, out to help that. So I always encourage everyone to have multiple ways of being weather aware. But, uh, if you live in my jurisdictions, which is the Colony and the Little Elm, I service both for their emergency management programs. Uh, we, we have alert, uh, emergency alert notification systems through both cities. Here in Little Elm, it's called Little Elm Alert. So if you live in the Little Elm area, I encourage everyone to uh, go on to the Little Elm Battleboard webpage and to uh, uh, find or to go on Little Elm Alert and register there. Also, we also have a text inversion if you do not, if you visit or do not wish to share your information in our webpage, which, which is safe. We, don't, we only use alerts to alert our residents. We don't share it with anybody else. 
But if you have visitors or relatives that come in, and again, since uh, Little Elm is really growing, when we are a destination, I have also in, uh, put in place a, uh, a text uh, version where if you just want to come in and you text uh, LE alert to 888 uh, then that's another way that uh, uh, people can have alerts uh, without having uh, put their personal information uh, if, if they're just visiting. So really, that side is for visitors, and the other side is uh, for registration is for, for, uh, for residents. But that's a great way to stay in touch. Uh, there's apps that go with uh, the Everbridge the little alert system, and again, uh, we will we do not uh, purposely send stuff out unless unless we need to. Uh, major accidents, road closures, a lot of areas that have been closed for a long time, we'll, we'll definitely uh, um, put that stuff out there. And especially if we have uh, uh, severe weather, severe weather is one of our major things. So we include also down in the colony, we have a Nixle. Nixle uh, so uh, you type the zip code of the colony into a seven seven seven. And then if you're a resident of the colony, you will also be able to uh, have that text for us. Uh, also, again, uh, you can also go to the web page of the colony, uh, city of the colony uh, web page to also uh, get that information. But it's important to stay connected and to have a way to receive local alerts. Uh, but if you don't live in my cities, uh, Denton County has uh, an alert system, and or any other cities around uh, the Denton County area will have their own. So please check check their uh, their alert uh, their, uh, web pages to check that out. One other thing I like to bring up here and to be prepared here in Little Elm is outdoor warning sirens. Outdoor warning sirens are a part of, it's just a tool that we use here uh, in the city and in, in most uh, of, of the north central Texas area. It's a tool, it's not the all the end be all. When we are put into certain uh, criteria that we all agreed upon in the area, we will uh, sound uh, outdoor warning sirens. So what that means to a resident or anybody here, when you hear an outdoor warning siren, Primarily, if you're outdoors, that's what it's for. You go inside, seek shelter, and seek information. That's what we want everybody to do. We don't want uh, to go possible. But we, we, we always have encourage everybody these days has some sort of phone, uh, some sort of weather radio, or some sort of backup. So we uh, definitely encourage everyone to have some sort of way to keep it warm when you're under, when we issue a, either a tornado warning or a severe weather warning. Because again, when we, when we do those, or when they come to the National Weather Service down to the local level, and that's just the conditions in the area are favorable for either tornadoes or some sort of severe weather. And so when, when we initiate those, well, we want you to take some sort of action. But we want everybody to have uh, be weather aware and, and know what's coming coming up before that happens. Because a lot of questions I get, if I can't hear my warning siren inside the house, well, again, they're not meant to be heard inside the house. They're outdoor warning sirens. So if you are in a public area, you need to go inside and to, uh, and to, uh, to seek shelter and seek information. Um, let's see. Other than that, I mean, those are the really big things I wanted to hit on. Uh, as, as a city, uh, we are prepared. Uh, we follow uh, the county guidelines also. We work together, uh, mutual aid. Um, I have a, so my office, I do a Facebook and Twitter, so we do a lot of social media. We try to put out a lot of information to keep the, um, our residents informed of uh, how to be prepared, anything that would help uh, our local residents to take action. Uh, I encourage everyone to uh, walk through upstairs and uh, check out some of the wonderful tables up there. Uh, check out the emergency management table. We have a lot of great information. And uh, hopefully, uh, if somebody signs up, and too, uh, we are raffling off a, uh, a weather radio to, to take home. So uh, other than that, if there any questions for me, I can turn it back over to Joe. Thank you, Travis. Appreciate your partnership. And I do want to remind everybody that we are live streaming, so we don't know that there uh, could be some folks on our on our YouTube channel as well as watching. So we're going to keep continuing. Uh, and our next presentation is a lakefront preparedness for in response. It's really a panel, but we have we do have a presentation, and we'd like to welcome Rob Jordan. He's a lake manager for Louisville and Ray Roberts Lakes, and is a, a lake manager with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So with that, Rob, welcome. Thank you, Jody, and I'd like to thank Congressman Burgess for inviting us from the Corps of Engineers out to uh, share a little bit about our goals and responsibilities. Again, my name is Rob Jordan. I've been the lake manager at Louisville and Ray Roberts Lakes for the last eight years. Um, our main mission with the Corps of Engineers for Louisville Lake is, of course, flood control and downstream flood protection. Louisville Lake was authorized in the late 40s under the Federal River and Harbor Act of 1945. 
Construction on the dam began in 1948 and it was completed in 1955. And we have basically three primary missions of why we were authorized construction of the lake. First and foremost, flood risk management or downstream flood protection for the city of Dallas and the metro area. Secondly, it would be to provide water supply to the city of Dallas. The city of Dallas actually owns the water rights in the lake. And then third, we manage the recreation and natural resources aspect. So we manage campgrounds, hunting areas, wildlife management areas, and other outdoor recreational type facilities around the lake. Next slide. Can't really see this very good in, in the light here, but this is just a map of the lake, and the red line on this map represents all of the federal land managed around Lake Louisville. So. We manage approximately 45,000 total acres and about 29,000 of that is the actual lake surface at normal pool elevation. The blue line on there represents what we refer to as our flow easement. And the Corps of Engineers acquired land on private property when they constructed the lake to actually temporarily inundate those private properties with floodwaters. And that's where the emergency response and preparedness comes into play when the lake is in flood. Next slide. This is actually a picture of Louisville Lake when it was going over the spillway. This was taken on May 31st of 2015. This was when Louisville Lake reached its pool of record, which was at elevation 537. So in this picture, the water is approximately five feet deep going over the top of the spillway, making a release through that auxiliary spillway going into the home fork of the Trinity River. So in this picture, that's approximately 21,000 cubic feet per second of water going downstream. And at this time, we were actually holding water back. Our floodgates were closed because Dallas had experienced so much rainfall. We didn't want to do any additional downstream damage, but this is where the lake was going over the uncontrolled spillway. And it's, that's actually occurred seven times throughout the history of the lake this being the most recent. Okay, for emergency management, uh, during periods of high flood waters, we call that our flood pool, we have surcharge releases. That is what was going over the spillway there. During those times, we have our own emergency management office out of our headquarters in Fort Worth, and they work hand in hand with Jody Gonzalez and his crew there in the Denton County Emergency Management, and we communicate with them very frequently and provide them with forecasts on what the lake is gonna do. Those forecasts are generated by our hydrology division in Fort Worth, where we have hydraulic engineers that are monitoring numerous gauges throughout the Trinity River Basin. We also conduct on an annual basis, we do tabletop exercises with all of the emergency responders that you see here today. And we make sure that they are familiar with our emergency action plan on what could happen if there was a problem with the dam and there was a breach or if there was just high flood events. Also, whenever we go into those high flood pools, it triggers additional surveillance by my staff at the lake. So as the lake is approaching flood elevation, we do additional monitoring of our instrumentation just to ensure that the dam is functioning as it's supposed to. And this is my last slide. Um, this is just the kind of a diagram explaining the pertinent elevations for Louisville Lake in particular. Um, you can see the, the dark blue line there in the middle of the page. That would represent what most people would refer to as normal pool. That is elevation 522 at Louisville. We try to keep the lake at that elevation, but of course being a flood control reservoir, it is not a constant level lake. So sometimes we're in drought, it's way below that elevation. Other years we're in flood stage and it's way above that. The next elevation up there is that green line. That is what we call the top of our flood control pool. That also coincides with the top of our spillway crest. So in the picture I showed earlier, that would be the elevation associated there. And then the blue line above that is the fluid easement line. That is when we are at the top of our, our fluid easement elevation when we're storing flood waters on private property at that point. And that, that has occurred one time throughout the history of the lake we got at that elevation. And then you can see the maximum design surface of the lake is elevation 553, and the top of the dam is at 560. That, that pretty much wraps up my presentation, and I think we have maybe some questions to answer. Though.
Anybody have any questions for the U.S. Corps of Engineers? Oh, we have questions. Right. Yeah, I guess uh, one of the concerns is, you know, if you read the paper about Norman Lewis from the Ashton flood, flood down to Dallas, and 30 feet island, and down there, you know, can you address, I know there's some work we've done on that. Currently, there is a, a team that is doing what we call the dam safety modification study. That's been an ongoing study for several years. They are making uh, preparations and entering into some contracts to do a very large amount of work to the dam to make some repairs. There are some uh, seepage areas that uh, have been known for, for quite a while now, and we are actually putting in place some uh, measures such as a, an additional berm where there's going to be a couple of areas where they're going to add soil to the, the downstream side of the embankment. Currently, right now, there's some work going on to address the strength of the actual spillway structure that was in the picture I showed earlier. We're doing some uh, drilling right now through the concrete monoliths, and they're going to be attaching anchors underneath that spillway just to bolster it up to make sure it can handle the high flood pool elevation. But those, that work is ongoing and will be conducted over the next two to two to four years before that work is completed. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Now, a lot of this is, uh, you know, if you're talking about Louisville, you're talking about Ray Roberts, specifically if you're talking about like Louisville, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I think that what you're seeing in Louisville is publicized because of its location. But I think that all dams uh, that, you know, across the state of Texas and the, and the responsibility of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers have, have all of these issues and upgrades and, and maintenance that, that, that jobs are being done. So I think that we're well protected by what the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers are doing and appreciate their partnership, keeping the county and municipalities and communities involved in that process as well. One of the things that Rob maybe did not mention, but their website is, is one of the most transparent websites I've seen. There's a lot of information, there's live information about what elevations are happening in lakes, it's updated. Uh, almost every five, ten minutes with the elevations, the things that's going on with river flooding. Uh, these slides that he presented and those, those examples of elevation levels are all on their websites for those particular lakes in our county. So I want to thank the Corps of Engineers for the great job that they do and again the partnership. So thank you. Robert. So right now we can move to, uh, let me go ahead and have Skit to from you guys for about five minutes. Just talk about it real quick. We do have live streamers. And then at 10.45, we will, we will have our weather keynotes at 10.45. That sounds good. But some of our audience is still here, so it's kind of what we do. That's all right. If you'll come up here, don't forget we are live streaming. So I don't know if anybody's watching that we did. Y'all, uh, some of our, you know, spectators were here earlier. So we do skits, and uh, like I said, we come up with little things, uh, you know, as far as the safety stuff that we try to present. So one of our safety messages, and y'all can see it in the flyer, is be first, first time. And basically what that is is just we try to encourage kids, even adults, that anytime that you're going to jump into a body of water, it doesn't matter if it's a swimming pool or if it's a lake, always jump in feet first, first time, because if you go head first, you don't know if there's a stump down there or you could hit concrete, that type of stuff. So, so like, little skit we would, you know, do would be, you know, we would come out, Coco, Kevo, and, you know, hey, Coco, man, you remember that, that big old tree? There, yeah, that tree that was down by the water? Tree, I don't remember what that's on. The, the tree? The core guy didn't talk about that tree? No. Yeah, so remember what we were talking about? We could, we could get on the very end of it, boy, and we could jump off and do front flips. Whoa, 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 whoa. Jump off front flips? Yeah. You mean, you mean head first? No, yeah, like front flips. No, 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 no. What? You never, ever jump head first into the water. You always jump feet first. Well, then. Never head first. But that's not, there's nothing fun about that. It's not about being fun all the time. It's about being safe and having fun. So, so, so why, why, why can't we jump in head first? Because you cracked your noggin. Cracked my noggin on the tree. What tree? The tree we were talking about two minutes ago. 
but we're on the tree. That's one of the things. Okay, and then we'll go to the, then we, we keep going in different ones, depending on the message, we can keep, you know, keep right. going. And, and like, I said, like I said earlier, there's nine of us, so we collaborate a whole, you know, pretty much a show, but we know, uh, sound bits, music, all the kind of whole stories. It's just a little something we do, so it's back and forth. A lot of our stuff is ad lib, so we don't have a script. Uh, we, we try to write scripts every once in a while, but we the most part, Coco and I have been with each other, like I said, 12, 13 years, so, uh, you know, we feed off each other. That was just, we walked in this morning while we were putting our makeup on, and I said, hey, when we talk about feet for the first time, let's talk about that tree that's, you know, in the water over there. Of course, the first thing he said to me was, what tree is in the water? So, so it's just little things like that, so, but appreciate it. Thank y'all. Thank you guys, appreciate it. All right. Mark Fox, you ready? <laughs> I see him over there. So we're, now we're back on schedule. We're right at 1045 for our weather keynote. And uh, uh, making sense of North Texas weather, if you can make sense of that. And I know that there's only one man, and it's not me that can do that possibly. And that is Mark Fox. He's our warning and coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service, the Fort Worth uh, Weather Forecast Office. So with that, Mark Fox, good to see you, sir. Good to see you. It's a beautiful day. You get to take a break, maybe? <laughs> I wish. There's a big event in Arlington going on. But uh, for, for once, there's a large event going on in Arlington. There's not snow or ice or anything like that. So. Uh, I think for this week, uh, Mr. Jones doesn't uh, mind the weather forecast. Uh, one of the things that I'm always asked is, uh, you know, what are you most worried about in this area and as far as weather? And really, it's kind of a hard question to, to answer because all types of weather can be hazardous. 2011, we, we lost 44 people due to heat, and that was uh, a very bad summer there. We have tornadoes, we have hail storms, we have pretty much everything that comes right through uh, the heart of Denton County and into uh, the Collin County as well. So hail, tornadoes, and actual heat is uh, the things that we really kind of worry about as far as uh, the weather forecasts uh, all the way through the year. We're heading into uh, summer. We've had a very cool April. We had a relatively warm, if you want to call it that, winter, although we had some very cold spells all the way through it. We had a very wet February, which actually is going to be a, a very good day coming into the summer months. Uh, once we had uh, the first three months or so of winter, we were a little bit below average as far as rainfall. That last week of February, if you remember that, we had 15.6 inches of rain or something like that in a week. And that is now going to be the record for the most rainfall for the winter time in the DFW area, at least uh, since records have been kept back in uh, 1898. I was not there, Rick, were you the first one taking those? Uh, I was, was close. Close, close. Yeah. it was Finfrock, right? <laughs> yeah. Finfrock was definitely there. And uh, so we had quite a bit of rain, and that's actually gonna be a good thing because if you remember 2011, I mentioned that earlier, that was a very dry spring, a very dry summer, and a very hot summer. Now we're still gonna have a very hot summer. Not much is gonna change there. We're always gonna have those very hot summers here in this part of Texas. Uh, but we are also starting out with the lakes relatively full, um, and that is gonna kind of help things out as we go along into the summer. So we're not looking at a repeat of 2011 or anything like that. From uh, my perspective as the National Weather Service, uh, we are the guys behind the scenes. Uh, you might uh, recognize uh, Mr. Rick Mitchell over here from Channel 5. Uh, when it comes to severe weather operations, we work with Mr. Mitchell and the other television stations and they work local emergency management. And we get together at least once a year at what we call our integrated morning team meetings. And that is the time when all of the Metroplex TV station meteorologists get together, National Weather Service meteorologists get together, and as many as possible of the hundreds of local emergency managers get together. And we talk about various things, about what 
do we want people to say and do when the sirens go off? What do we want people to do and say when the severe thunderstorm warnings get issued? What do we want people to do when tornado warnings get issued? We talk about these things as a team. And I think Rick will uh, agree with this. We don't always fully agree with each other, but we talk to each other. And those relationships are what we really try to do and try to build on days like today because days like today are when we truly get together and try to think about what's going to happen later on in May this year. April was fairly quiet, severe weather season. By the way, this next coming week, we're going to have our next shot of severe weather coming back in on Wednesday and Thursday. Of course, we've got a golf tournament close by. We have uh, Mayfest coming up, festival seasons everywhere. It's just a fact of life. But what uh, separates the weather service from the rest of the integrated warning team meeting is we cover 46 counties. So Travis, one of my local emergency managers, how many counterparts of yours do I have to take care of? Just about all 40, whatever, you know, 20 to 30. Yeah, 46 counties, there's uh, eight state districts in there. And there is 474 individual jurisdictions that we cover. So what we try to do is get all the information out as we can. I have the luxury of time from the National Weather Service. I can sit at a radar screen and inter interrogate what's going on with the radar, with the satellite, the observations, put that all together. And at that point, we put out what we can. And I think, uh, as I give the microphone over to uh, Rick Mitchell from Channel 5, I don't think you have the luxury of time all the time on television as you're trying to talk. And we have chat sessions. And we type away, we try to furiously give a lot of information out. So the local emergency managers like Travis uh, and like Jody and, and Rick and everybody in the media can get out there and talk about the same type of thing because what we're after as the integrated warning team is a consistent message but from multiple voices. So if Rick is saying one thing, I'm saying another, there's a breakdown there and that's why we kind of talk on those days that are nice like this. So while I've got a little bit of the luxury of time, I don't think you've got the same thing with the live camera on you. So I'm going to pass this over to uh, Rick Mitchell from Channel 5. Before I do that, far. what's the uh, uh, most devastating natural disaster or largest group of people that we face? That we face? Heat. Heat? Yeah. Uh, on a more heat. consistent basis, probably. Just on a more consistent basis, and over time, it's been more heat than anything else in drought. So were you guys here in 79? Uh, I was playing Little League Baseball in Oklahoma. So, yeah, 79 and then also in 83, New Year's Day. We got two inches of ice. Yeah. It's no more can do it. It's so it shuts it down. It, you, it shuts you down. Yeah, I had one in 83, another one in 2000, and of course 2013. Ice storms are pretty bad, but they are rare. Uh, heat occurs every single year. Most years in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, more people die from heat than any other natural disaster. That includes tornadoes like Rowlett and other tornadoes that have happened throughout the area. Why do ice storms seem to sneak up on us? Well, I don't want to say this, but um, I'm not the best ice forecaster around here. Uh, if you go to Caribou, Maine, they're not going to know a hook echo when they see it, but they're going to understand everything that goes into an ice storm. Uh, but one thing that I do like about this group of media meteorologists is when we do have an ice storm, most of the time we're saying something very similar. So at least we're agreeing on what we all think should happen. Uh, I take all the responsibility because, you know, sometimes those forecasts don't turn out just like I want them to. You know, I tell people I'm perfect, but they see right through that. But. Uh, you know, our forte is really the severe convection, and that's something that we do better than any other office in the country. And ice storms, thank God, they're rare because they are difficult. Okay. Mr. Mitchell, this is a mistake giving a media guy a microphone. <laughs> I should do it. Oh, thank you.
I should wrap this up here in about an hour and a half. So, uh, <laughs> Mark is right. Uh, I can't fathom doing my job without uh, Mark and his team at the National Weather Service, and they are uh, the best office that I've ever worked uh, with. Uh, I came here to uh, North Texas after spending 18 years in Oklahoma City, and the National Weather Service office there is superb. And then I came here, and, and these guys, uh, the men and women, have, uh, have beat them. So uh, that's uh, quite a statement. Uh, so in this day and age of, of social media, and Mark talked about communicating, I, I've really kind of changed my thinking about what I am. Uh, yes, by, by degree, it says that I'm a meteorologist, but in actuality, I'm more of a communicator. It's my job to communicate to you what is going to happen. And Mark and I and his staff and my staff and the staffs at the, the other television stations work hard to create better lines of communication so that, uh, that we can pass that information on to you. And one thing I've noticed uh, with, with the advent of Facebook and, and the ability for people to have just daily conversations with me which never used to be the case. Somebody had to write me a letter or call me on the phone. Now they can just, they can message me. And I've, I've found out that there are, there are a tremendous number of people who are extremely frightened of storms. I mean, they have a storm anxiety. And so I look upon what I do as a way of communicating to them what's happening, how bad is it, and is there a reason to be that frightened. And I always go back to one thing, it's you've got to have a plan. And, and hopefully by telling someone who's just deathly afraid of storms, if you have a plan, there's a good chance that you're going to survive this storm. I tell all of them, I say, look how long you've been surviving storms. You've survived every storm that has come up in your life. But I think if you have a plan, it kind of eases a little bit of that anxiety. And so being the communicator that I think I am, that's what I thought that I would talk about just a little bit today, is having a plan. Now, if you're a native Texan, if you've lived here a while, you're probably like, yeah, I got my plan. I know what to do. Well, that's great. Some people do, some people don't. We have 100, I think Nestor told me this, 150,000 people coming to North Texas, moving into North Texas every year. So in a lot of those, did a little research, we found that more than 60% of those are coming from locations that don't have severe weather on a regular basis. So if you're coming here from California or Oregon, you don't, you don't deal with tornadoes on a regular basis. So uh, I always try to make sure that everyone knows what to do. And it, it is very simple. I mean, I've broken it down into two rules. That's it. Rule one, rule two. Wherever you are, wherever you go, whatever you do. Rule number one is you always want to get as low as you possibly can, right? Now, I grew up in Nebraska, and we had basements. So we could go to the basement, and that's what I did, because when I was a kid, I was afraid of storms. So if, uh, if you know, some dark clouds outside, where my friends would be, where's Rick? Oh, he's in his basement, probably. So you get as low as you can. Well, we don't have basements here in Texas, at least I don't. So you always want to be down on that lowest level. If you're on the third floor, get down to the first floor. So that's it. Rule number one, get as low as you can. Okay? Rule number two, put as many walls in between you and the outside as possible. Why is that? You want to find an interior room. Well, the more walls you have between you and the outside, the more protection. Makes sense. So that's it. Rule number one, get low. Rule number two, find an interior room. Now, if you dig a little deeper on those rules, and by the way, those rules will, will work whether you are at home, in an apartment, in a hotel, at the mall, in church, in school, it doesn't matter. Wherever you are, those rules will work. 